Howdy and welcome to the 10-Week Bible Study. This is week six, day three of our study of Isaiah. I'm your host, Aaron Hibbs, and today we're talking about Isaiah 20 through 21. Welcome back to the 10-Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Aaron Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start today? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us and speak to us. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Isaiah 20, starting in verse 1. In the year that the supreme commander, sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. So Isaiah is giving us a timeline here. So <clears throat> Sargon, king of Assyria, sends the general, the captain, the commander of the army, down to Ashdod. Now, this is in Gaza, or what we would call Gaza now. This is the Philistine territory. So he's kind of gone. Uh, he's already attacked Damascus and Israel and carried them away. And now he's coming down the western side of Israel and attacking Ashdod of the Philistines. And... Um, and so he's laying siege to it and he's going to capture it. And this is the, the context for what's going on. So this is not just that this, a lot of these other prophecies, Isaiah is just the Lord speaking to him and saying, say this to Egypt, right? And so we see that there's some historical context going on, but there's also Isaiah has been prophesying, you know, like yesterday, the Egyptian prophecy, none of the things that Isaiah prophesied have, have happened yet. And so we know that some of these things are, are, couple thousand years into the future that Isaiah was prophesying to. And here we see one where this is actually rooted and grounded in something actually going on. So Isaiah is saying, in the year that Sargon sent the, the army to Ashdod, that's when the Lord spoke to me. Verse 2, at that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. He said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so going around stripped and barefoot. And so Isaiah is in mourning, right? You, in, in those days you would, you know, go around barefoot or you would, you know, and have dirty sandals on, you have sackcloth on, uh, sackcloth, you know, like a burlap kind of clothing, something very uncomfortable. And you're doing that to mourn and remind yourself that you're mourning. If you're wearing sackcloth, it's going to like just always be abrasive against your skin and remind you that, oh yeah, things are bad. I should probably pray about this. I should I should cry out to the Lord about how bad things are because we all know that as things deteriorate and get worse and worse, you just kind of set new norms as far as, you know, as things are going downhill, uh, you just kind of set a new bar of like, well, this is kind of normal now. And you can forget that, wow, things are actually really bad right now if you just kind of get used to things. And, and so... There's some genius actually to this idea of putting, you know, dust and and um, and ashes on your head and sackcloth on your body, which is what they used to do. Is you're going to, you know, have stuff falling out of your hair constantly. It's going to make your hair gritty and uncomfortable, and you get this clothing on that's uncomfortable. It makes it impossible for you to just adjust to whatever the new normal of bad is. I think we could. In our own culture right now, we could probably learn something from this and cry out to the Lord for how bad things have gotten if we wore sackcloth and put dust in our heads to remind us that this is not right. This is not normal. And so that's what Isaiah is doing. The Lord tells Isaiah, take that off. Now, the interesting thing is the Lord doesn't say, take that off and put something else on. He's like, just take that off. And so some people have said, well, Isaiah went completely naked and... Um, I'm not sure if that's the intention of this passage. Most people, I think, have interpreted that. And that's it's certainly possible. Um, there's a, a moment in, in the book of, of uh, 2 Samuel where David takes off his kingly robes as the Ark of the Covenant comes into Jerusalem. And so he takes them off and he, he's, he's leaping and dancing around. And his wife... Michal essentially says, hey, you know, you're dancing around naked with the ladies of Israel here. You've made a fool of yourself. And and the idea here is I don't know that David was naked. That would not probably 
Like, there's this joyous celebration and all of this stuff going on. And David takes off his kingly robes and he's he's acting like, hey, I'm a commoner. I'm just like a normal person worshiping the God of Israel with everyone else as this comes in here. I, I don't think the implication is that David went naked. It's that David took off his kingly robes and he's in just like his normal like undergarments, right? He's in his like white undershirt and, and, and shorts kind of thing. That That's like, I think the implication there. That may be the implication here as well, but commentators and different people and thousand sermons preach as Isaiah's naked. Maybe he truly was naked. Um, you know, sometimes the Lord does weird for the sake of weird. I don't encourage you to, you do weird for the sake of weird to try and like appear like Isaiah or something. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. <clears throat> so I would say either Isaiah was actually but naked. <laughs> um, but I think more, more likely he just is, is wearing, um, not the full normal garb that they would wear, like his, essentially his undergarments, which, you know, you could still say, well, he's going around in his skivvies and that's, that's naked enough. Maybe you would, that's how you would say it. And that's maybe what they're meaning. Either way, he's not dressed like a normal human being during this period of time. He's, he was in sackcloth and now he's just not wearing proper clothing to say the least, whether he is actually running around naked or he's just running around in his undergarments. Either way, this is kind of shocking. And let's find out how long he's going to do that for. Verse three, then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. So, again, this is, I think, where a lot of people think that maybe Isaiah was naked is... Because the idea is that he's looking like how the Egyptians and the Cushites will be carried away by the Assyrians. And it's very common in these days, either they would strip the people naked and parade them through, like they would have this caravan. They're all like tied by the hand. We have, um, there's there's ancient carvings and stels of these conquests and the captives, they would like literally bind their hands uh, together and then bind their hands to the next person's hands behind them. So they're all bound, you know, by the hands like this, and they're in this chain of people bound, and they're all naked, uh, being paraded through, literally naked, to uh, shame them and embarrass them on top of the the shame that they would already feel for losing their nation. You know, this is obviously to strike fear in anyone. It's like, this is, hey, you want to fight against us? Fine. But when we win, this is what we're going to do to you. So maybe you should think twice about fighting against us and just play ball and let us rule you and everything will be fine. Right? That's the idea here is we're trying to strike fear and shame and embarrassment in people that would stand up to Assyria. Um, Egypt, the, the context here is Egypt had been, uh, sort of captured by, I believe Tiglath Pileser the third, um, a few, you know, a couple generations before this generation or two before this, um, and now Sargon and, uh, oh gee, uh, the ruler that came after him, um, they go and they reconquer Egypt essentially. And, uh, because Egypt and Cush rebelled against them, they're going to be quite brutal with them. And so it's very common that either you uh, you strip these people literally butt naked and parade them, or sometimes you would send emissaries, people back, you take all their clothes, and the only clothes you send them in, you literally cut out the rear end. So literally their rear end is hanging out. We see that happen in the book of 2 Samuel when David's at war with different people. And so um, this is really just trying to make a show and make people think twice before they, they come and attack you. Otherwise, you're going to have to face this kind of shame. Verse 5, those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. And that day, the people who live on this coast will say, See what has happened to those we relied on and those who fl we fled to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. How then can we escape? So, uh, back then, there's 
we know through in, in Jeremiah, as the Babylonians were attacking, the people of Judah tried to make a treaty with the Egyptians and tried to run there for safety. And Jeremiah all the time is prophesying, and now this is after Isaiah, but Jeremiah is prophesying, don't do it. The Lord is against them as well. It's not going to work. And they still do it, right? And so all during this time period, they're trying to make alliances. There's there's all of this war going on, right? Aram, um, northern kingdom of Israel, they're at war. They've got the Edomites, the Moabites, they're all at war. Egypt and Cush are at war. Egypt in a civil war. And you got the Assyrians coming down. And so there's just this, you know, think of this as like World War I Europe, right? Where one little incident, this one assassination happens. And then it's like, Hey, we're on these guys side and we're on these guys side. And all of a sudden you got all of these people making these alliances without really thinking about the implications of all this. And all of a sudden in a moment, there's one assassination and now an entire continent is at war. And it's the same kind of thing here where you've got all of these alliances and all this is going on and everyone's trusting in everyone else to hide and try to help them out. We're going to defeat Assyria. And the Lord's like, listen, none of this is going to work. I'm the one pulling the strings here. Not, not you guys, not Assyria. Assyria is going to conquer you. And then I'm going to conquer them and punish them for what they've done to you. Like I've got all this under control, but you thinking that Egypt is going to help you. They're not. I'm the one in control. And it's going to go down exactly as I want it to. You know, that's the, the thus saith the Lord part here at the end of Isaiah chapter 20. Let's continue on into Isaiah chapter 21, verse 1. A prophecy against the desert by the sea, like whirlwinds sweeping through the Southland, an invader comes from the desert, from a land of terror. A dire vision has been sent to me. The traitor betrays, the looter takes loot. Elam attack, media lay siege. I will bring an end, I'll bring to an end all the groaning she caused. So this, this, um, uh, the desert by the sea, this is almost certainly against Egypt, right? But this is a little bit cryptic here. Um, but anyway, we're already talking about, uh, Elam and media. So this is like the Persians. So this could be, um, at this time, right? This is, if you can imagine, this is kind of to the east the, to the southeast of the Assyrian Empire, to the little bit to the southeast uh, or northeast, I guess, of the Babylonian Empire that's to come. Uh, we know that we have the Assyrians. They get conquered by the Babylonians. The, the Neo-Babylonian Empire lasts for a very short period of time and then it's conquered by the Persians. And so, you know, again, it's like, what on earth are we talking about? Who are we talking to? And, and when are we talking about and all of those things are still on the table here as we're moving forward verse three at this my body is racked with pain pangs seize me like those of a woman in labor and pause right there this is now isaiah speaking this. so this this word from the lord that he's he's being given this is causing isaiah pain continuing on verse four or verse three I'm staggered by what I hear. I'm bewildered by what I see. My heart falters. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I longed for has become a horror to me. They set the tables. They spread the rugs. They eat. They drink. Get up, you officers. Oil the shields. This is what the Lord says to me. Go, post a lookout and have him report what he sees. When he sees chariots with teams of horses, riders on donkeys or riders on camels, let them be alert, fully alert. And the lookout shouted, day after day, my Lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stay at my post. Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses. And he gives back the answer. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. Now, this is very interesting, right? So this, now we're getting the picture, right? If, we're, if we understand history, we know that the Babylon, the Neo-Babylonian Empire that was essentially started by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the second or third, whichever one he was, the Nebuchadnezzar the Great, um, it 
literally falls in a day to the Persians. Right. And that's what we started out this with is like, Hey, you know, these, these, these Medes and these Persians, um, Elam, this is all, it's all speaking about Persia, Persian empire. Now we're moving forward here to where Babylon is going to fall. So we've, we've in some ways taken a radical departure from the timeline that we had in chapter 20, but we're still talking about the same areas and the same people. But at the same time, this is the same exact phrase that's used in the book of Revelation about an event that's going to happen in Babylon that has not yet happened. It's going to happen in the last days. And essentially the, the narrative of the book of Revelation says that the Antichrist, the Babylon, the great, is going to oppress and martyr God's people, Christians and Jews. And then at some point, God is going to essentially appoint the Antichrist to completely annihilate Babylon. And in one day, Babylon will be gone. And the same phrase is uttered in the book of Revelation. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Let's continue on. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. My people who are crushed on the threshing floor, I tell you what I have heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. A prophecy against Duma. Someone calls to me from Seir. Watchman, what is left of the night? Watchman, what is left of the night? The watchman replies, morning is coming, but also the night. I would ask, then ask. It come back again. This is uh, this is Edom. So this is going down south toward Arabia. Um, so it seems like we're talking about Egypt, uh, Israel, Babylon, um, the Edomites, and how we're going to move into a prophecy against Arabia. So this is a, a broad geography here. It seems like Isaiah may be talking to in this prophecy, and it's about the Persians conquering the Babylonians. Verse thirteen: A prophecy against Arabia. You caravans of Dedanites who camp in the thickets of Arabia, bring water for the thirsty. You who live in Tima, bring food for the fugitives. They flee from the sword, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the heat of battle. This is what the Lord says to me. Within one, within one year, as a servant bound by contract would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will come to an end. The survivors of the archers the warriors of Kadar will be few. The Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. So we're finishing here saying the Lord is, is saying within one year of Isaiah's prophecy here, uh, Arabia is going to be conquered. This is one of the types of passages that makes Isaiah difficult to read the entire book 10 times in 10 weeks, because there's a lot of disparate things going on in just this one chapter. Isaiah is prophesying about Babylon is going to fall and Babylon hasn't even ascended yet. Assyria is still, you know, we know that Assyria is still in the process of conquering everything around Isaiah and, and Assyria hasn't even fallen to Babylon yet. Babylon hasn't ascended to its place where it could be conquered as this empire and, and the, the Medes and the, the Elamites, the Persians, they're there and they have their own little small kind of empire thing going on, but they're nothing compared to these other guys right now. And so there's a lot happening in this passage that's like, holy cow, Isaiah, the Lord has given you so much very detailed information about what's to come, but it's at the same time so hard to, to parse out. And then here at the end, we know that it's not going to be the Babylonians or the uh, the Persians that are going to attack the people of Arabia. It's, it's got to be the Assyrians. So we've got just a lot of stuff going on here as far as, you know, what's happening in this one passage. And again, this is why I've split Isaiah into two different sections so we can take it in a little bit smaller chunks because we've got so much to chew on these passages. And again, I'm not trying to explain every single thing. And there's a lot of things that, I don't fully understand. I don't think anybody fully understands. Um, but again, I want to be your cheerleader to keep reading this and keep going through this and just stay in God's word, stay in God's word and, and devour it over and over and over again. For the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time.
Hey, thanks for watching the 10 week Bible study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing? You're always hearing people talk about. It really helps other people find out about the show. And my heart is for people to fall in love with God's word. Thank you.